Welcome, welcome, welcome to the virtual launch of Fallow's A Mist Busters Guide. I am thrilled to be your MC for this exciting event. My name is Contessa Cooper and I am the Community Engagement Manager here at Thallo, a climate tech company that believes in the power of the VCM to help solve the climate crisis. At Thallo, we are using blockchain technology to build a carbon exchange that allow businesses and individuals to buy, trade, and retire high quality verified carbon credits. But what sets us apart from the rest? Three things. One, we put carbon credit developers first to capture more value. Two, we tackle the over commoditization of carbon. And three, we focus on quality to make it easy for buyers and sellers to identify and purchase high quality credits. We believe these key elements are essential to delivering the highest impact potential in the VCM. Today's webinar is supported by Climate Collective, a leading coalition of stakeholders from investors and nonprofit organizations to entrepreneurs and scientists, levering trusted, sustainable digital infrastructure to unlock verifiable climate action at scale. Its mission is to build a trusted market for high quality digital environmental assets that enable people and the planet to thrive. By using mass coordination tools to solve mass coordination problems, Climate Collective is advancing planetary health and a regenerative financial system. You can find more about them at climatecollective.org. We are excited to launch our Myth Busters Guide, designed specifically for those familiar with the voluntary carbon markets, but may not be as familiar with blockchain technology. We have some incredible guests with us today, including Nathalie, who is our Strategic Initiatives Manager at Thalo, and Ryan, who is our CEO. Nathalie will give us an overview of the guide, and both Nathalie and Ryan will take your questions using the QA feature. So without further ado, it is my honor and a pleasure to hand it over to Nathalie. So let's get started. Thank you, Contessa, and thank you all for joining me on this journey to bust myths and discover the truth about blockchain and especially its use in the voluntary carbon market. Because indeed, blockchain is increasingly being associated with the voluntary carbon market, as is also shown by the many companies that have started in this space. As you can see in the illustration on the right, there's exchanges, marketplaces, measurement and verification providers, a lot of companies working at the intersection of blockchain and the voluntary carbon market. But today's question really is, is blockchain the solution to many of the problems persisting in the VCM? Or is it a solution that a bunch of blockchain geeks are trying to fit to the solutions in the VCM? This guide will help to clarify. The guide is split into two parts. The first part is a general briefing about blockchain and some common misconceptions about this technology. And the second part is more focused on blockchain and its use in the voluntary carbon market. Let's start with the first part, blockchain in general, and let's start at the very beginning. What is blockchain? If you remember one thing from today's webinar, please remember that blockchain is a technology, just like AI is a technology, 5G or cloud computing. Think of blockchain as a collection of digital records, a database, where the records are linked together in a specific way that makes them strongly resistant to alteration and that are protected using cryptography. Crypt cryptography is just a difficult word for, say, protected using mathematical equations and puzzles that only the right people can solve in order to support the operation of the blockchain. 
Blockchain has a few important attributes. The first one is that blockchain is decentralized, meaning information on the blockchain, so these digital records, are shared amongst all the participants in the blockchain, making it very difficult for an external person or entity to change that information, making information on the blockchain highly immutable. Blockchain also enables great autonomy because it gives the ability to transact between peers without involving central authorities such as banks or governments. Blockchain is also highly transparent because everything that happens on chain is publicly available for everybody to see. And finally, these mechanisms of consensus, these cryptographic algorithms and the decentralized nature of blockchain make it highly secure. Now, I understand this all sounds very good, but why should you care? Well, blockchain, again, is a technology that is very well suitable in, in applications where you need fast and low cost transactions between peers, exactly like in the voluntary carbon market. Many consider blockchain to be the next version of the World Wide Web, the third version, Web 3, where Web 1 was a version of the internet where everybody could read the same information. Web 2 is the version as we know it now, where everybody can read and write. And Web 3 is the version enabled by blockchain, where everybody can read, write and own. So before we dive into the myth busting, first, a few common terms that will be very useful to you when we are speaking about blockchain. I won't go into details for all of them, but I encourage you to download the guide from our website so you can go through them when you have some more time. But basically, this page dives into the difference between blockchain, Web3, and cryptocurrencies, dives into the difference between proof-of-work and proof-of-stake consensus mechanism, it dives into the difference between stable coins, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, utility tokens, etc. But let's start on our myth-busting journey right now. General myth number one, probably the thing I've heard most often is, I don't understand blockchain, I don't trust it, I think blockchain is a scam. Well, I guess this is an understandable misconception if we think about all the stories that we've recently heard about FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried. But again, this is a very important thing to remember. Blockchain is not the same as crypto. Blockchain is a technology. Crypto is a digital currency. And it's true that these digital currencies rely on blockchain for the way, the way they're working. But it doesn't mean that everything that is blockchain is crypto. And even if we look at cryptocurrencies, it's true that some, of, some cryptocurrencies are used for criminal activity. Chainalysis has made an investigation around this, and they estimate that under half a percent of all cryptocurrencies is used for illicit activities. However, according to the United Nations, it's estimated that between 2 and 5% of global GDP is used for illicit activities and criminal activities. And fiat currencies is the currencies that we know like dollars or euros, which means that criminal activity in fiat currency is about 400 times greater in absolute value than criminal activity with cryptocurrencies. And finally, if you're afraid that blockchain is really prone to hacking, well, that's completely not true. The decentralized nature of blockchain makes it very well suited against hackers because to alter a chain, hackers would need to control more than half of the computing power or token stake on a distributed database, which is almost impossible to achieve. It's actually a very, very secure technology. And if you download the guide, you'll also have access to the three videos that explain these three aspects in much more detail and better than I'll ever be able to explain. Let's move on to the second myth, something that I hear very often too. Hey, but you're working in climate tech, you're trying to solve climate change, but you're using blockchain. Doesn't that consume a lot of electricity and cause negative environmental impact? Well, it could be, but it depends. And it depends on the consensus mechanism. Probably the most well-known consensus mechanism is the proof-of-work consensus mechanism. That's also the one that Bitcoin uses. It's true. In a proof-of-work consensus mechanism, you need huge amounts of computational power to mine the next blocks and solve all the cryptographic equations because you do it by brute force. However, there's also different consensus mechanisms, such as proof of stake or, for instance, Ripple's XRPL consensus mechanism that are both very low energy. You might have heard about Ethereum's big merge last year in September. 
they changed their consensus mechanism from proof of work to proof of stake and thereby reduced their energy consumption by 99.95%, making the electricity consumption negligible and the footprint as well. So, of course, we at Fallow, we make sure that we're only building on blockchains that use low energy consensus mechanisms. General blockchain myth number three, blockchain is inaccessible and benefits only the tech savvy. Well, that's completely wrong. Actually, the reason why blockchain was founded by the very early founders was that the founders wanted to thought that people have the right to interact freely with each other without any type of intermediary in digital life. And that's exactly why they created a technology that allowed people participating to transact between one another without using banks or governments and without being dependent on central authorities and third parties. The philosophy was that this would provide freedom and autonomy for all those who engage. And then I understand it might be quite scary to start working with blockchain. You don't really understand it. How can you start? But actually, again, blockchain is a technology and this technology can be underlying to a Web2 interface. And Thalo, the Thalo exchange, is a very good example for that. Buyers and sellers will be able to access the Thalo exchange through a normal internet browser. And that internet browser, like the Thalo exchange, what's underlying is a blockchain technology transaction network. But of course, the ones who are using it don't necessarily need to know or understand anything about blockchain to be using our exchange. Basically, anybody with a computer and an internet connection is able to benefit from the benefits of blockchain. We've already finished the first part of the webinar. Let's proceed now talking about the use of blockchain in the voluntary carbon market. But first, let's do a status check of the voluntary carbon market and the way it looks today. Because the voluntary carbon market today has a lot of challenges. It's been growing steadily over the last few years, and more and more carbon avoidance and removal methods are being developed, and more capital is being directed to these projects. There's never as many companies as today who have communicated their net zero ambitions and made net zero claims. But there are increasing fears of greenwashing, a lot of uncertainty about the quality of different credits and different technologies. To solve this, everybody's kind of looking at greenhouse gas crediting bodies or the registries and lawmakers to see how Article 6 will be implemented, how do carbon credits on the voluntary market coincide with NDCs, the registries, of course, it's their task to only verify high quality credits, but also the goal is that they don't take one or two years to verify credits. So this is really a difficult trade-off to make. And also, we want as much capital as possible to be directed towards these kind of projects that avoid and remove carbon. And we want as many as possible project developers working on these projects. But it's very difficult for new and small project developers to start being active in this space. And the consequence of that, that supply in the voluntary carbon market is largely dominated by legacy players just because the smaller players don't have access to the necessary financing. So the challenges can actually be summarized in the six circles you see at the bottom of the page. Verification takes too long. Financing is a barrier. Intermediaries take up a lot of value. There's limited liquidity on the market and transacting can be very complex. There's very little pricing information and there's sometimes double counting issues. And wonderfully, blockchain, if well-designed, can solve all of these problems fully or partly. But I invite you again to download the guide on the website and go through the way blockchain can solve these issues in more detail. However, we're here today to bust some myths, so I will proceed to do and go on exactly that. VCM myth number one, registries have banned tokenization of carbon credits. Wrong. Let me tell you a story that started in October, 2021. There was a blockchain company that thought we should digitize carbon credits, we should tokenize carbon credits, and they acted unilaterally. The way they did it is they bought a bunch of very old and low quality credits that nobody actually wanted to buy anymore, and they tokenized them. And there was huge demand for these kind of tokens, and so everybody started buying these tokens, and therefore they created actually a demand for what we called zombie projects. And another thing they did is before putting the credits on chain, they retired them. 
thereby defeating the actual purpose of buying and retiring a carbon credit to offset your own footprint. So, of course, the registries saw this happening, and that's why they reacted by issuing a moratorium on the tokenization of carbon credits in May of last year. So this wasn't a great situation for the voluntary carbon market and the blockchain market. But there was one positive aspect in this whole story, and that is that this sped up the registry's thinking about tokenizing carbon or digitizing carbon. So registries have started moving. Vera has organized a public consultation on digitizing carbon. Gold Standard has set up a working group of which Tello is a part, and even the World Bank is looking towards blockchain to make a global database of all the carbon credits ever issued. So the um, truth about this myth is that carbon registries are very much in favor of digitizing carbon. They just want to do it in the right way and they want to take their time. And Talo is here to help them in doing that, like we have done with Biocarbon Registry and Pure.Earth already in the last two months. Visia myth number two. Tokenization of carbon credits always implies pooling. This is something that shocked me when I read it on the Financial Times, and I actually reached out to the reporter to tell her uh, that's not at all the case, but have received very little response so far, unfortunately. The reason people think that tokenization implies pooling of carbon credits is probably because the first ever tokenization of carbon credits was done with a pooled approach. So again, the credits that were retired and then put on chain and then pooled, that was a first example of how it was done. And many of our competitors also take this approach of pooling carbon credits with the argument that it creates liquidity, which is of course true. And liquidity is something that we need in the voluntary carbon market. But we at Talo also believe that it's very important to keep the uniqueness of every project. And so the way we go about tokenizing carbon is by creating a digital twin of every carbon credit. So a carbon credit exists on-chain and off-chain. And the on-chain carbon credit reflects all the characteristics of the off-chain carbon credit. So when we tokenize carbon, we have their vintage, the project name, the geography, the SDGs, co-benefits, everything included in the digital twin of the carbon credit. And there's always also a communication in two ways between the digital carbon credit and the off-chain carbon credit. Meaning if the digital carbon credit gets retired, the off-chain carbon credit, of course, also gets retired and this gets reflected in the registries. VCM myth number three, tokenization of carbon credits incentivizes speculation and that is a bad thing. Okay, well, while it's true that digitizing carbon makes it slightly easier to trade and thereby also slightly easier to speculate, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Let's go back and think about why the VCM exists. The VCM exists to direct as much money as possible to projects that avoid or remove carbon from the atmosphere. So we need money going to these project developers and to the global south. Now let's think about what speculators do. Speculators invest much more than traditional investors in more risk, higher risk, higher reward projects, which are projects from newer and smaller project developers, which are projects from new promising methodologies, which are new products such as forward carbon. So actually, by investing in all these newer things that are a bit more risky, they do help the scaling of the voluntary carbon market. Speculators also buy and sell more than traditional players in the carbon market, thereby creating much needed liquidity in the carbon market. And finally, we also think that projects that get traded more often are more higher quality projects, thereby we think that speculators can even incentivize quality in the voluntary carbon market. So actually, these speculators are not all that bad. They actually help directing as much money as possible and incentivizing as many parties as possible to start investing in carbon removal and avoidance. And finally, VCM myth number four, tokenization of carbon credits leads to further fragmentation of the market. And let me explain what I mean by fragmentation of the market. It's true that the VCM has a lot of different marketplaces, different methodologies, different registries, little liquidity, little price transparency, and a lack of a central database. 
On top of that, there's also many intermediaries between the buy and sell side that form a huge, huge source of fragmentation. Now, tokenization, if done right, and actually here, I bring together all of the arguments that we've touched upon during this webinar, can solve many of those problems. Thanks to a two-way bridge like ours, working with the registries to digitize carbon can be a continuation rather than a fragmentation of the market. And by bringing credits on chain, everything becomes more transparent. Everybody can see who buys, who sells, how much, at what price, etc. And marketplaces like Talos and others can reduce the need for intermediaries, thereby reducing fragmentation even more. So all of these things are really things that we need to make the voluntary carbon market pick up speed and scale more quickly, all thanks to blockchain. Isn't that wonderful? So here's an overview of all the of all the myths we've debunked today. I hope you enjoyed joining me on my journey. I hope you learned a thing or two and that you even are maybe a bit less skeptical about blockchain. I encourage you to download the guide from the website and take your time to go through it. There's much more in there than we had the chance to touch upon today. In any case, I thank you for tuning in and now back over to you, Contessa, for Q&A. Natalie, such a wonderful and informative presentation. But I do have a couple questions. I hope you don't mind. If you don't pull carbon credits, how do you generate liquidity? Oh, yeah, right. That's a very good question. So it's true that pool carbon is indeed better for liquidity, but we want to keep the uniqueness of every project. So we put a lot of thought into this and we created something that is called dynamic pooling. So basically on our platform, a buyer can go and create their own liquidity pools with the aspect that they find important in a carbon pool. So for instance, if you're a North American buyer, you might want to invest in projects developed in North America. So then you can filter on our website, which only for projects coming from North America. And you might find some biodiversity co-benefits really important. So you can add that as another filter, thereby creating a pool of projects that match your criteria. And then the pool will have a weighted average cost of all the carbon credits in that pool. And then you can just buy that pool in a bulk. So we keep the uniqueness of every project, but still it creates liquidity for buyers. I think I have a better understanding now. <laughs> Thanks for that. I still might have some questions later, but I know where to find you. Ryan, I have a question for you. If you had to choose the most important advantage that will derive from using blockchain in the products that you are building, what would it be? Good question. Firstly, big thank you to Natalie for a super comprehensive presentation and to Contessa for a the level of enthusiasm I expect I'll never be able to summon in my lifetime. So thank you for that. But really, I think this is a critical question to answer. I think adding technology for the sake of it only really serves to add complexity. And I think we can all agree this is a market that needs no more complexity at this moment in time. So I think I'm going to adapt that question a little bit, answer here with two broad advantages, but arguably there are more. So I think the first is composability. There are numerous markets that can easily inset carbon from e-commerce providers offering offsetting to their customers at the point of purchase to financial market derivatives, airlines, and even, even payment providers like PayPal. But in order to facilitate these models, we need to fractionalize credits from the ton to the kilogram or even the gram. Creating a digital twin of, this, of these carbon credits makes this effortless and it really allows composability or integration into these models. And that's both within public blockchains, but also in, in non-blockchain environments. And to the second point, I think this is data. So I expect most on this call would agree that data is absolutely critical to a market that's becoming more mature with purchasers understanding this market more every day. So having data immutably stored on chain ensures that data, both current and historical, 
cannot be tampered with and also may be seen publicly, which is crucial. So a full immutable audit trail that's publicly available increases this amount of data available to purchasers, enables them to make better purchasing decisions, protects the buyer's reputation, and crucially over time, moves the market towards projects that have more robust and higher quality MRV standards. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your insight and your wisdom. So glad that you are here to answer these questions. And thank you so much for the compliment on my energy. I just love being in spaces like that. Now we want to hear from you, our audience. We have some Q and A's that I have collected and Natalie and Ryan, I'm going to defer these back to you. And so the first question that I want to ask is from Virginia. If I'm a project developer with VERs for sale through its blockchain platform, are payments still done through banks? Therefore, are we stuck with their fees and exchange rates? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question, Virginia. So. I think ultimately we have to rely on payment rails as they exist in their current form. So that unfortunately means relying the interbank network as it currently exists and the fees and the pain that goes through that. And trust me, I've been in capital markets before trying to disrupt that market as well. So I know your pain, but there are cross-border payment solutions that are coming out day after day um, through SWIFT, through our partners and, and those that led our seed round, Ripple that make these much easier on the cash leg of that payment. It's also worth mentioning that Valo in itself and the platform that we're building solves some of the operational issues that will give you headaches at this moment in time as a project developer. So for example, you won't need to KYC the numerous buyers that are looking to purchase your credits. We will KYC them through the platform. Buyers will deposit onto the platform and then use a balance to purchase your credits. So therefore, there's just a single withdrawal leg and therefore a single set of fees. I think as we move forward in this space, we can make that a more efficient process, but we're doing our best at the moment. Hopefully that helps. Thank you so much for that, Ryan. Our next question and comment comes from Philip. Thank you for being brave and courageous and stepping up to tackle these myths. This question is, how do you manage the hash integrity for on and off chain VCM records? One thing that blockchain does very well is data integrity. And that's data integrity in the past from the audit trail that will exist on chain and to ensure that that data hasn't been tampered with. So for those of you that aren't technical, there's there's a, a hashing mechanism that takes place with any data that exists on, on chain. And what that means is if you change a single letter due to something called the avalanche effect, if you change a single letter in, in, in a set of data, once a block has been committed to the blockchain, then you'll get a completely new hash. So you can just compare hashes with the data that's stored on chain against the data that's being stored off chain with the MRV providers. If those hashes don't match up, you've got a problem. Somebody's tampered with that, that data somewhere. So ultimately, it's about comparing those data hashes, storing the data in, in a sensible fashion. You know, data is expensive to store on the blockchain, but we can store data off-chain whilst retaining the integrity by using on-chain technology. But it's a really great, great question. Natalie, I have a question for you. You did all of this research and studying and put together this amazing presentation. And so my question to you is, if I wanted to learn more, what would be the best method to do so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Of course, most of the things I learned, I learned from my great colleagues at Dalo who 
patiently explain to me every aspect of this guide. But I would say there's also a lot to read on the internet. And I've kind of looked for like the best resources and linked them up in this presentation. So you'll see a lot of orange words in the presentation that all refer to the things I've read and the videos I've watched. So I would say maybe start here, start by downloading the guide and reading it into all of its detail and especially the linked videos and resources that I've added to the presentation. And of course, I mean, maybe we can continue our quest on educating people about the use of blockchain with the team. Thank you. And I did put the link to the guide in the chat to make sure that you have the opportunity to download it. I'm going to take just a few more questions before we wrap this. Oh, here's a great one. Amazing talk, Natalie. Of course, of course, of course it is. Her cool question. Can you spend a moment discussing if and how credits are updated in real time? And what is the mechanism for multiple exchanges to talk to each other to make sure there's, there's no duplication across exchanges? Ooh, great question. So maybe I can take that one. So the mechanism for multiple exchanges to talk to each other, <clears throat> that's something that we're talking to exchanges in the space, both within blockchain and off-chain as well, about building out a single supply-side aggregation. And ultimately, that's one, one of Fallow's goals. So the Fallow exchange is an example of what can be achieved by a supply-side aggregation. So aggregating all of these registries into a hub-and-spoke model but then allowing all these exchanges to plug into that. But I think what's important, uh, an, an off-chain an off -chain setup that exists beyond just the on-chain application integration, which is that there needs to be a freezing or a custody of the off-chain credits to then build the digital twin on an exchange. I think as we get more efficient in the marketplace and also ultimately you know, across the sector, then we can freeze those in real time using Fallow's liquidity layer and deploy them to exactly where the demand's needed. So hopefully, I think that answered the question, but please let me know if not. Yeah, maybe you can also answer the part about how it gets updated like live. I mean, or I can also explain a bit more about that. But basically, there's a few transactions that happen that the registry needs to be aware of. So when the credit gets listed on the exchange, Talo takes custody of the credit. So that's one update. Then when the credit gets sold, of course, the ownership changes. We don't have custody anymore. And then there's a new owner of the credit. Well, this gets fed back through the two-way bridge, which is basically an API with the registry. And so at the registry side, the owner also gets updated. And then when the owner decides to retire, they push a button on their buy side login page on the Talo exchange. And then this also, again, gets fed back to the registry and the registry issues a proof of retirement that again gets sent to the retirer. So Ryan, correct me if you have anything to add, but that's how it works. Great, great answer, Natalie. All I would say is the reason that custody leg is so important is so that there isn't an off-chain and an on-chain market. There's just a market. Yes, so, uh, continuation. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that prevents that, that double spending potential. Wonderful. One last question before we wrap it up. Another great compliment, great presentation. Thank you so much, team. Does Thalo interact with all of the upstream digital MRV platforms or is it only through registries? That is a great question. And that's something I've also been working on a lot. So yes, we believe actually that the digital credit of the future is more than just a digital twin of what exists on the registry. We think that the digital credit of the future will incorporate live DMRV data. So live measurement data of the credit, even after it's been verified, exactly to go against all the, you know, the doubts about quality of the credit. And we see this probably happening in two phases. So Ideally, DMRV will start replacing traditional MRV, so making it very much more scalable. So instead of somebody having to go take a plane and look at the, at the way a forest evolves or whatever, measure the circumference of the tree trunk, we can have satellite imagery and AI to estimate how much carbon is being sequestered every year. 
So we really believe that DMRV, once it reaches its full potential and is able to match with the existing methodologies and standards from the registries, that it will actually slowly replace traditional MRV. And then once the effort is already been done, pre-verification of tagging all this verification data onto the credits, it's only a small tech lift to also incorporate it it onto our exchange and tag the digital data onto the credits, on the digital credits, so that it's there for everybody to see, thereby again increasing trust and increasing quality in the voluntary carbon market. I hope that answered your question, but happy to talk about the MRV anytime. So please do reach out. I am learning so much from this webinar. I'm so glad that we are out here busting out all these myths. And so there is a question from someone who wants to play devil's advocate. And the question is, wouldn't some clients still prefer some level of pooling? So I, I love people to play devil's advocate, by the way. So Thank you to whoever, whoever that was. I think our, so our approach is not to avoid pooling entirely. Our approach is to have a requisite level of data and to retain specific and certain characteristics of the projects themselves that allows more comprehensive pooling and that allows personal curation or allows curation of pools by trusted brands. So rather than avoid pooling entirely, we're starting from a place where pooling is easier, more trustworthy, and, and, and less difficult to arbitrage. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for playing the devil advocates game. We have another question here about marginalized communities. It says here, a marginalized community and a least developing countries are generating carbon credits certified under GS by intervention of community water purification system. How do you think the blockchain can help in such interventions, specifically over claiming issues? That's a complex question. I think just putting the first part of that question to one side, the role of blockchain is to specifically help this issue around claiming. So we can inherently see due to characteristics of blockchain technology, exactly who's owned those credits at any moment in time, whether that be the, the project developer, as soon as those spot credits are, are verified by gold standard, whether that be the first purchaser on the platform or the second, third, fourth purchaser on the platform. And the technology that underpins the blockchains that we use will ensure that only the beneficial owner of those credits can then go on to sell those credits, claim them, offset them, whatever they want to do. So I hope that answered the question. I would also, yeah, I would also add that probably for those people in the least developed country, it's quite hard to find buyers willing to buy these credits. And they probably have to rely on intermediaries to, you know, connect with companies and corporates wanting to offset their footprints by buying their carbon credits. And it's even harder to negotiate a fair price, I would think. So that's really where platforms or like marketplaces like ours come into play. If they pass a simple onboarding and KYC process, they can just list their credits onto our platform, just like any other credit. And there will be like, there will be corporates and huge amounts of worldwide buyers also onboarding on our platform from the buy side. And that's really helpful for them. So, cause they don't have to rely on any intermediaries and they should be getting a fair price because they are also able to see previous trades on our platform and like similar projects, how much money they've been selling for. So I think for them, it's going to be, Palo and blockchain are going to be very important to just find buyers that are willing to pay a fair price. Thank you so much. All right. One last question. Do you have other activities other than tokenization as registries do not allow it now? So tokenization is just something that our software enables. It's really not the be all and end all of the credits that, that pass through Fallow's liquidity layer. The honest answer is that registries at the moment, especially Vera, they have a moratorium, as Natalie mentioned, due to Klimadao and others in the space. But it's important to, to note that registries aren't against tokenization per se. They're 
just conscious that they want to do it right this time. So they want to work with tokenizers. They want to work with digital carbon credit providers just to make sure that everything's in line, just to make sure that the proper KYC is there, just to make sure that they can track those credits, that it's not extractive to project developers. So we're talking to almost every registry you can imagine, including the, including the largest registries in the space. And they're all at different periods of allowing that tokenization. But we're very confident that in the coming 12 to 18 months, most of the registries in the market will allow tokenization in a way that defends their integrity standards. Yeah, maybe it's also worth saying that we have already integrated with two registries, namely Pure Earth, Earth and Biocarbon registries. So that's what Definitely. we're doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> more to come as well. More, more, in, more in the pipeline very soon. Yes. My head is spinning from all the information, all of the knowledge. I cannot wait to take some time out to process everything. If you have additional questions, if you need some time to process, the best way to do that is in our fallow community. And I posted the link to our Telegram there in the chat. Feel free to join us there. I wanna thank everyone for joining us on this myth buster journey. Special thanks to Climate Collective for all of your support. And thanks, of course, to Natalie for all of her research and Ryan for all of his wisdom. Before we wrap up, do either one of you have any final thoughts that you would like to share with the audience? Just one from me. I know there were a bunch of questions that came in, really good questions. We've taken note of those. And if it's okay with you guys, we'll reach out and, and answer them in person. Yep. And my takeaway would be, please remember, if you remember one thing, blockchain is a technology and it is a technology that has the potential to unify the carbon markets in a way it's never been unified before. Such a wonderful last thought. We hope that you found this webinar informative and it cleared up some of the myths surrounding blockchain technology. I know it did for me. If you have any further questions or would like to learn more about Thalo and our work in this space, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And don't forget to download our Mythbusters guide if you haven't already. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great, amazing, wonderful rest of your day.